I'm Karen Lloyd. I'm at the University of Tennessee. Um, and uh, this is, I hope this is not embarrassing, but this is the strangest prompt I've ever gotten for a talk. Um, so what this talk is supposed to be is it's supposed to be um, equivalent to a mathematician in the year 1900 named David Hilbert, who set forth 23 questions that defined the future of mathematics. Let's see if I get there. Yeah, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> so I looked it up. I was like, who is this guy? What do he do? So uh, this, uh, it's, this mathematician says, Hilbert's address of, in 1900 to the International Congress of Mathematicians in Paris is perhaps the most influential speech ever given to mathematicians, given by a mathematician, or given about mathematics. So, you know, MBD. Um, <laughs> And furthermore, it goes on to say that it was more than a collection of problems that outlined his philosophy of mathematics and proposed problems uh, important to his philosophy. And um, I'm not so arrogant as to think that like, I can say this for our entire community because, the, as we've said over and over again, the most amazing thing about the DCO is that it brings people together who are in utterly different disciplines, and there's no way I can develop a, a philosophy about all of your disciplines. Um, but one thing that... Um, oh, well, I, uh, sorry, can't see my next slide, so I'm not hitting it perfectly. But um, uh, another thing that, that led to my, um, how I'm going to try to get to the, try to answer this, this prompt um, is that Donato Giovanelli sent me this paper and said, you might be interested to know that Wynogradsky in 1949, who was the father of modern culturing techniques, so this is somebody who really showed um, how we can take uh, microbes from the environment, and if you're very careful and very persistent, you can get them in really pure cultures, utterly um, devoid of anything else. And so I think of him in that way, but actually what he said was, conditions of pure culture in an artificial environment is never comparable to that in a, in a natural environment. One cannot challenge the notion that a microbe cultivated, sheltered from any living competitors, and luxuriously fed becomes a hothouse culture and is induced to become, in a short period of time, a new race that cannot be identified with its prototype without special study. And I'll include in this um, also lacking its environmental geological setting. Um, because when I think about life on Earth, uh, my philosophy is that life has been on this planet almost as long as rocks have. So it is in my mind, ridiculous to try to study the evolution of life or really anything about biology without necessarily bringing in geology into it. And perhaps it's controversial, but I could propose that perhaps the inverse is also true. Um, I will give uh, credit. I did not embark on this completely on my own. It's kind of weird to give your credit slide in the middle, but that's what I'm going to do. Um, these are the folks who um, sort of gave me various inputs along the way. Um, don't, if I say something really stupid, um, don't blame them. <laughs> I kind of had to interpret um, what other people say uh, and to my own words. Um, but, okay, so back to David Hilbert. Um, so you had these 23 questions, and uh, apparently about 13 of them, they just kind of knocked out of the way really quickly. So uh, really 10. 10 was the number of questions that are still outstanding and driving everything forward. So um, I'm going to give you 10 questions. <laughs> 23 just felt like too much, anyway. Um, these may not be the best 10 questions, but they're what I think about. So the first one is inspired by some conversations that I've had over many years now with Everett Schock, um, what he calls the Methuselahome. Um, I, 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 and I'm sort of linking this to a broader theme. I, I think that it's very strange to have an entire ecosystem that functions so incredibly slowly. Um, Biology is not really set up to study this. Um, everything we do in cultures uh, works at a very, very fast pace, at a very high metabolic rate. And then we base everything we know about biology based on these organisms that are just firing on all cylinders, which is ridiculous. I mean, this bears no resemblance to how they evolved or what they're like in nature or anything relevant to reality. And I think that when we look at uh, microbes out in nature, functioning very, very slowly, then the other thing that, that sort of comes up is what is the evolutionary pressure on being extremely slow? How do you get a payoff when nothing ever happens? Um, and that forces us to maybe start thinking on geological timescales, uh, because that can be relevant. If a cell lives for 100,000 years or a million years, then suddenly it matters whether your plate moved, for instance. Um, 
So uh, the Methuselahome idea is Everett's, and it uh, took me probably four different times having him explain this to me. Who was it that said we have to be said explained three times? Yeah, <laughs> um, before I finally understood it. But it's the coolest idea. Um, and I don't know, the th my point is that we can't discount this possibility um, that microbes are still and the plates move through them and they grow to keep up. So you grow and you know, the organism doesn't know in which direction to, to send their progeny, but if they divide and sort of the world moves around them and the gradients, the chemical gradients shift around them due to diffusion or due to advection or just something moving their environment around them, then the ones that are in the slightly better environment will be the ones that live. So in effect, you have these populations that are in steady state relative to location on Earth and then Earth moving through them. Kind of crazy. Second question is how is life distributed across the surface um, and within different places? This is something that came up in multiple conversations and I absolutely agree. Um, we've, you know, really nailed this question of whether there is life in the deep subsurface. Yes, two thumbs up, there is. We're, we're good with that, we can move on. And now, it's hard to sample biology in rock um, because it's hard to know that you've really gotten a clean sample, that you haven't contaminated it. Uh, to get a rock sample from these deep places, you kind of have to bust through and kind of, um, uh, disruptive sorts of ways. So I think that there's a lot more work to be done um, in deep rock fractures. And also just how, how life is distributed across the, the subsurface. We don't really know these things. Um, how much carbon is in the core? Um, obviously, this is not my domain. <laughs> but uh, I think it's really interesting. I mean, this is one of the things that has been fun with DCO is, you know, going to, to a talk um, where you know, the real controversy is that there is any carbon at all in the core because people thought, I guess, previously that it was all iron, um, which is fascinating to me. I mean, that's a huge part of Earth, and it really is significant if it's a, it's a relevant reservoir for carbon, um, something I'd never thought about. And then to the mantle, how does carbon vary across the mantle? You know, I, I have this, again, not my domain, but I have this really stupid, simplistic view of this like lava pool layer, which I guess is not right. Um, <laughs> but you know, there are all these pictures that people draw, like Seven's lovely uh, G plates things with um, blebs coming up and things going down. And, um, but actually, we don't have that real model of exactly what's happening and where it's coming up and where slabs have broken off and moved around. Um, so that's, that's something that's really going to be, I think, refined as we go forward. Um, question six is, um, what are the exchange rates uh, for deep and shallow carbon across deep time? I mean, this is, I think, a huge question. Just, it's cool to learn about the subsurface, but we kind of care about its connections with the surface world. And so where does that happen? At what time scales does it happen? And how did it happen in the past? That is a complicated question. Keep us going for a while. Question seven, what are all the metabolic rates of all the microbial processes, and how do they feed into our biogeochemical models? Um, this may seem like something that, yeah, we've probably got that all figured out, but surprisingly, we really don't have that very well nailed down right now. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and do these, question eight, is do these proteins from the strange microbes have notable adaptations to pressure and temperature? Um, I would just love to know whether um, if we take um, some of these organisms from the deep subsurface and recreate some of their biomolecules however we want to and squish them in diamond anvil cells, I feel like we could sort of do that for another 10 years and find all sorts of things out, um, just with different classes of, mo of molecules. Um, question nine, what is abiotic versus biotic? Obviously, I didn't define the what here. You can make it hydrocarbons, you can make it minerals, you can whatever you want. Um, I think there's a lot of questions about the role that life plays in geological processes uh, that we don't have nailed down. So the last question, oh, oh, question 10, sorry. I did a bad job. Uh, I was supposed to set that up better. <laughs> um, so, see, I can go backwards. Um, uh, so I started out at DCO when I was very firmly early career. I had just gotten my faculty position, um, and now I feel that I don't really deserve that moniker anymore. I mean, I'm kind of moving into the, what's the next group up called? Mid, mid-career. Um, so I wanted to <laughs> go to someone who was, <laughs> I don't know if I said something really dumb. Um, I wanted to go to somebody who is firmly early career, who is a postdoc, so this is Joy Bongiorno, whose picture you just saw, but um, she is a, 
Um, she got her PhD with me at the University of Tennessee. And so, you know, I, I posed it to her, you know, your, your real early career, what is, what's the future, what's the thing? And I, and I said, don't worry about answering me, you know, take your time, this is a big question, you know, think about it. She's like, I don't have to think about it, I'm gonna answer right away. Climate change, <laughs> I didn't even know you were gonna say that, Bob, climate change, like it's absolutely the fundamental driving question of this next generation of scientists. And we're gonna miss out on drawing in new people if we stick our heads in the sand and don't pay attention to climate change. Um, this is a crisis and everyone's concerned about it. Um, and furthermore, um, it's important to bring in historically underrepresented voices to tackle it, especially people who are directly affected by its effects, people in low-lying um, areas or people in Arctic areas. Um, it's just important to, to bring as many voices in as we can and to deal with this. So Joy is actually on a, um, forgot the name of it, an Arctic uh, climate change working group. And so they recently published a, uh, a correspondence in Nature. And so I cribbed a, a little section of it. Um, we need to strengthen, this is the end of their, this is their final message to all of us. We need to strengthen ties across subfields of polar science to promote genuinely transdisciplinary research. That was, that was their uh, request of all of us. Well, we're set up. <laughs> this is genuinely transdisciplinary research. And it can be hard to imagine how the two things connect, the deep subsurface world and the surface world, but um, it's the biggest reservoir of ca carbon on the planet is in the subsurface. And carbon is the problem, it's causing all the problems that we're having. So there is something, you know, we can all sort of think of ways, I'm not saying we should drop what we're doing and start making models for sea level rise. I mean, that's not, unless that's what you do, because I know some of you do that. Um, the point is to take the expertise that you do have and apply it to the societal problem. I think that's absolutely crucial, and thank you for listening to my Hilbert talk.